years, she said, am I a candidate for stem cell treatment? The real question is, are you a candidate for a big invasive surgery? Would you venture to say that nobody's not a candidate for the cells? Okay, if you're not taking a bunch of payments every day, and it's not keeping you awake at night, and you're still walking three miles a day, why in the world are you thinking about new investment? The question is, is it going to make enough of a difference to avoid those big procedures and, and get you over the hump from a functional standpoint? If every time a tire is a little out of line or needs air, you had to put a new tire on, that's what a lot of surgeons approach a patient like. Welcome to the Zero Downside Podcast with Dr. Wade McKenna, sponsored by MoabTexas.com. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Zero Downside Today's topic is going to be a, another major question that we always get, and I feel like the first thing everyone sends in their submission with, and that is, am I a candidate after they list their one area of concern? And I think our main topic I'm going to go through with Dr. McKenna and Ashley of, you know, what does make you the ideal candidate? Does age play a factor? Does your previous surgical history and the need for surgery now you know, alter your candidacy. And I'm going to let them kind of break apart each and every thing that makes a candidate the ideal one for a stem cell treatment. So I'm going to let Dr. McKenna have the floor. If you could start us off. Yeah. Um, here, and I always say this, but you know, here's the cool part, right? Um, Ashley's been my nurse on the traditional orthopedic side for a really long time. And with the movement and consolidation of the clinics is the nurse on the regenerative side and the traditional side um, and has her own little trainee now. But, but for me, when it talks about surgery, when someone says, am I a candidate for a cellular injection? What they're asking is, hopefully what they're asking mm -hmm. is, is there a, a is, on the overall scheme of where I'm at, Mm -hmm. with how much I hurt, with what my films look like. Is there anything else that would work other than a major surgery? That's a totally different question, right? Mm -hmm. Because if that question is, look, I'm just not ready for a total knee. Well, then what other options are out there that can make a difference for you? Then there are plenty of less invasive options because we work really hard to, to have all the cool toys, right? There are plenty of less invasive options that may help you short of knee replacement. If someone comes in and says, I've been told by five guys I need a total shoulder. Is a total shoulder the only thing that's going to help me? Well, hopefully, um, it depends on kind of, in, and Ashley makes a really good point. I always make a flow chart out for people. And I'll literally, in my mind, I think of everything like that. And, and for me, it's where, what have you done already? Like, are there some bridges you've burned um, with some of the surgical treatments that you've had? Or have they narrowed kind of our treatment options for you or are there people we will look at and just say look you've already had this 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 and this it's it's time for a knee replacement or we just you know all i have left in my bag of tricks is a total mm -hmm. and there are times where that's the case um but you're coming to somewhere for treatment that i'm a fellowship trained orthopedic trauma surgeon right i mean i i i done plenty of joint replacements actually the the joint that we use for joint replacement on the knee i helped design the instrumentation to put it in um there's a partial shoulder replacement i designed the instrumentation and the technique on that so if we need the most invasive treatment out there are we adept and and skilled at doing that yes is my goal to always administer the biggest thing i have to someone no because a lot of people and, and that's the other question, and Ashley pointed that out. What did you say about um, when she said, am I a candidate for stem cell treatment? The real question is, are you a candidate for a big invasive surgery? Because a lot less people are candidate for a big invasive surgery than are candidate for what we do, right? I mean, you don't, especially with sedation, anesthesia, the quality of your own bone marrow may be compromised by age, but it's still the cell that's getting you through if i did a big surgery on you how are you going to heal well is is the quality of my stem cells limit my outcome yeah it may not get you completely better where we want you but is it also limit your recovery after a major surgery yeah because those are the cells that help you heal right so i, I think that 
when people worry about are they candidate for the injections, really it's kind of misplaced sometimes. I think the real worry is, are you really a big, a great candidate for a major reconstructive surgery? And I think a lot less people meet that category than meet how many conservative treatment options would I want to go through before I took the time out of work, the time in therapy, the, the recovery time and downtime post-operative is always significantly greater from the operative side of traditional orthopedics than it is from the regenerative medicine point of view. And fortunately, there are a lot of major reconstructive and traditional orthopedic procedures that we don't have to pick and choose. If, I, if someone said, um, knee scope or cells? Well, what's the problem? Is it mostly lack of cartilage? Do you have a locking, catching, giving way? Well, if you have a big loose piece floating around your knee, just injecting cells in there is not gonna get that to go away. If you have mechanical symptoms, I'm gonna scope your knee, take that piece out. But do I have to pick between those two? No, because if you're already asleep, I'm gonna take your marrow, concentrate it, put those cells in your knee. Now, is that going to necessarily get you completely over the hump? No. Does knee scope grow cartilage? No. Do the cells of bone marrow help activate your body's ability to heal and grow cartilage better than it does in, without them? Yes. That's been really well published for a really long time. It lowers your infection rate. It lowers the time uh, to get over the surgery. It decreases your risk of long-term inflammatory change. So if you have chronic inflammatory tendonitis, I can inject the tendon at that time. If you have an ACL stretch injury, I can inject the ACL stretch injury. It'll heal better. A scope doesn't help it heal cells. So it's not an either or for a lot of people, but when you're talking about like hip replacement, mm -hmm. you have to be a really healthy to go through hip replacement and it'd be worthwhile because almost every a third of the patients end up needing transfusion at the time of a hip replacement. And it's not that at the time, it's in the first couple of days of the recovery when they're, that's the reason you admit someone after a major surgery is to just control their pain and see where their blood volume is gonna fall out. Do they need IV fluids? Do they need IV pain control? Do they end up needing blood before, they, before you send them home really anemic and tachycardic because they're not stable because now they've dropped a little bit, you know, they lost a unit of blood during the surgery after the surgery with the swelling. That's where the, that's why you hospitalize a patient. Mm -hmm. That's also the reason we don't have to hospitalize a patient when we focus on the minimally invasive side of what we do. So a lot more people are candidate for the minimally invasive approach to their problem mm -hmm. than, than they are the biggest thing I have. Mm -hmm. we, we have. In my mind, I always have a flow chart. And at the end of it is joint replacement or at the end, at the end of it is something that metal is involved or major surgical reconstruction is involved. My flow chart has expanded as the efficacy and safety of all these minor procedures has gotten better. And as we've backed into a lot of this data over the last 20 years of using cellular products mm -hmm. at the time of traditional surgery. And now in my mind for a lot of things, it's kind of replaced the surgical procedure mm -hmm. with something way less invasive that is much easier to recover from much less painful to get through, much less costly if you're paying for a bunch of therapy and hospitalization and coming out of your pocket cash to a hospital for a surgery. If, if that's what we're comparing to, the regenerative, less invasive side of that with cellular medicine wins every time. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, there's not a lot of downtime associated with what we do. Um, is it, especially when you compare it, and I think the big ones are, Comparing an interdiscal injection from a, from, with a lot of back pain mm -hmm. that has an annular tear. If you compare this injection to a fusion, we win that hands down as far as how long am I going to be off work? How much am I going to hurt afterwards? Do I have a risk of long-term hospitalization, infection, a redo? Like the revision rate uh, and the failure rate of lumbar fusions is quite high. And the adjacent level failure in the subsequent surgical rate is quite high. And with the injections, that's not been found to be the case. Most of the patients that we end up seeing that find us are looking for a minimally invasive option because they've already had something major done and not done very well, right? The, the, I think in the beginning, especially on the neck and backs, 
I think most of the patients that we treated were people that already had several surgeries somewhere else and it had gotten worse or not gotten better and then gone back and the, them told that they need another big procedure. Mm -hmm. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So they may not have sought a cellular medicine or regenerative conservative option in the beginning, but when what you had didn't work mm -hmm. and then you're told you need it done again, that's a lot of people's first step into this journey on finding us. Mm -hmm. Do you think? I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that kind of the way it's worked out? Would you venture to say that nobody's not a candidate for the cells? Because I can think of a patient specifically that flew in to see us because he's not heart healthy. He's His cardiologist would not approve him to be put under sedation of any kind. He fell and needed his wrist fracture. Treated. Yeah. Treated. And uh, he had bone dramatic marrow. deformity. Yes. And so he did his bone marrow draw awake. You did that under local. And, and he had, we, we kept checking on him. Are you okay? Are you okay? He's like, yes, I'm fine. Like, I don't feel anything. Like, maybe just a little twinge in my hip. But we did his bone marrow draw. He was talking to us penning. the whole time in his penning and his injection. We never put the man to sleep. And he's sedation in a block. He's actually coming back to see us very this, soon. Next week, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, I, I think uh, now the most a, unhealthy patient, it, which is a great example of you, you know, we're much more able to pivot and stay. We can always go less invasive. We can always get bigger. Like it's, it's easy for me to go to the biggest thing we have every time. That's not talent. Like if you always to defer to the last phase of the flow chart. It doesn't take talent or decision making or a long discussion with the patient to educate them on that. People come ready for that a lot. It's the people that don't aren't ready for that. Because they're not ready to change their lifestyle or they want to get back to their lifestyle as quick as possible. And so they've already sought another orthopedic surgeon and they've been told, hey, this is what's gonna what it's gonna take. And then they come and see you and then they say, I mean, when we pull patients back and we do all of their counseling before Dr. McKenna comes in the room and they've like, well, this is my second opinion or this is my third opinion because I don't like what anybody's told me. And my friend just so happened to be treated by Dr. McKenna and got great results. So that's why I'm here just to see what he's got. I hear that a lot. And how shocked are you? And I know because I see the look on your face a lot when you, you'll pull, pull up someone's standing film, because I think standing films, there's a lot of different x-rays we take in the clinic that aren't necessarily a part of the normal workup in a lot of offices anymore. They should be. Um, how shocked are you sometimes when you see a patient that's that three doctors have been told they need a knee replacement and you pull up their standing films? And they're not bone on bone or collapse. They just hurt. Yeah. And, and the question is, does it keep you awake at night? No. Like, are you taking, or are you just taking a lot of pain medicine every day? No, I don't take anything. Okay, if you're not taking a bunch of pain medicine every day and it's not keeping you awake at night and you're still walking three miles a day, why in the world are you thinking about knee replacement? Right there, there are a lot of fish to fry before you get to the point of taking that joint out. And I think patients just honestly don't understand what it all entails in regards to replacing their joint. Mm -hmm. Maybe they haven't been counseled enough. Um, because maybe that's all that specific doctor had in his tool belt. Right. Um, and that's what they think is going to help the patient. Um, and we work, look, we both worry on setting expectations right on what we're doing with the minimally invasive side. You know how much harder it is to set expectations okay when someone thinks that a total knee is not a big deal? Hmm. I, that patient's really unhappy. Hmm. If they've been told, oh, this is no big deal. Just you know, replace your we, knee. We just replace your knee. And, you know, eight weeks out, they still can't get their leg out straight. They're struggling in physical therapy. They can't sleep at night. They can't get comfortable. That patient wasn't ready for that, for that procedure. Or say their times. wound didn't heal. Mm -hmm. Oh, or, or, or they got infected mm -hmm. or they had a clot. I, I, and we see a lot of patients that have already failed or not done well with those procedures. And then our, that's, and unfortunately, that's where cellular medicine gets stuck is cleanup, right? Mm -hmm. But the best patients are the ones, hey, I've been told by three guys I need. And so I had this fusion at this level. And I did great mm -hmm. for a few years. But now I'm having the same kind of pain, but they say it's the level below. I don't want another fusion because this one didn't last that long. And if they fuse that one, is it going to keep the level from below that? From Like, I don't want to just continue to have serial surgery. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else I can do? 
Yes, there, there usually is, mm -hmm. right? And is it easier to get through this than, than that surgery? Yeah. It, is, is this going to give you, there's no one that this, that it's not going to make any difference at all. The question is, is it going to make enough of a difference to avoid those big procedures and, and get you over the hump from a functional standpoint? Our goal is to keep you as functional as possible in as least amount of pain with as little bit of head of not having to fight headwind every day to be able to go for a walk or get out of bed mm -hmm. or take pain medicines every night to go to sleep. And I think that's much easier to do when I'm not leaving a, 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 a big wake with a knife, right? Mm -hmm. I, there's, when you do surgery on something, you're not healing it. You still have to get over the surgery. And I think that's what, when people try to compare regenerative medicine to surgery, the thing that they discount isn't the recovery from the cells, it's recovery from the traditional part of what we do. I like the traditional part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Gave away, we tell people all the time, I gave away my 20s and half my 30s to learn to do this job. There's a certain amount of, of rationalization mm -hmm. that comes in with that. You have to think you have the, the, the solution for people. Like you've mm -hmm. convinced yourself you're doing the right thing when you do a big invasive surgery to someone or you wouldn't be there doing it. Right? You're not doing it for some secondary. You're doing it because this is the only thing you think is going to make that person better. I there's a big part of me that has pulled back a lot from that because we've gotten so many people better with something less invasive that the patient is the one that drove the boat on. Like there's people out there, especially in the beginning with some hips that I would just say, look, you just need a hip replacement. And patient went, I don't want a hip replacement. My father died with the hip replacement. Um, um, you know, I, 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 I had the other hip replaced and I lost a lot of blood. I had an infection. This is my third hip. I don't want to do this to the side. I want to try this. And they will be like, I don't know. I, Look, the, well, what's the downside? That's how the podcast got its name. Well, the, po the downside of this is it may not help enough. Is it going to hurt me? Not really. Can I get infected from it? No. Like, is it going to cause cartilage to, 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 to wear away faster? No. Okay, so if there's not a big downside, and certainly the downside of this is less than a hip replacement, mm. then why wouldn't you want to try it on me? And my answer was, because I'm not sure it's going to make a big enough difference to keep you from needing a hip replacement. And patients are like, look, if you buy me a couple of years, I, and, and I'll do it again. Like, if, you can, if there's any chance this can make a difference, I want to do this. And 10 years ago, it took a patient saying that for me to try this. I mean, the bone marrow kit now is a couple thousand bucks. It used to be like 10 grand, right? So mm. I didn't want to spend someone's money on something I wasn't real sure I was tilt. I was working hard to tilt the scale in our favor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to treat people I knew were going to get better. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people at the end of the spectrum that I kind of would cheat to the more invasive procedures. They had to convince you. They yeah. had to convince me. Mm -hmm. And people did because they were motivated and wanted to get better without it. There's still a golfer we see that every time I see him, he's like, hey, look, I still haven't had a knee replacement because I told him no 15 years ago. Look, you just need a knee replacement and move on because he's, you know, he's symptomatically unstable and swollen all the time. And he'd been told by everyone else you need a knee replacement. And he finally set me down and just said, if you replace my knee, could you guarantee me that I could play golf in three months? And the answer is no. And he goes, well, no one else will either. I said, I think you could. Like, I think I can have you back on the golf course in four to six weeks after a knee replacement. But, but it depends on swelling and how hard you work on your range of motion. And, and there's a lot of other things your body right mm -hmm. how do you recover mm -hmm. like i don't know how you're going to heal right i know what i'm going to do and i'm very methodical in the in the operative suite on what we do because that's the only way to get standardized results is do things the same way every time but when his question was okay well if you just stuck a bunch of cells in me, could i play golf i'm like well are you playing golf now he's like yeah so then whatever you can do now you'll be able to do after i do the procedure he goes so there's not like six or eight week downtime no like it's all based on swelling and pain. The, as you can progress as tolerated by swelling after we do this procedure. We did the procedure 15 years ago. I thought for sure a few years ago when he called in, the, a new, a new uh, postnatal tissue graph came out and he saw that some, something on Facebook or something about us doing that. And he called, checked back in and said, hey, is there a chance I could help me? And it was like, well, oh, hey, how are you? Like, I made sure I called him back because I was curious as, like I thought he had for sure had a total at some point because he lived out of state. I think he's from Arizona. And um, he, he said, no, I'm doing great, but 
you know, I could always do better because I'm still skiing all the time. I'm still playing golf a lot. I was like, wow, then yeah, I think that there's, there, oh, by the way, now we have this, this, and this too. So I have some more new kind of toys from when I see you. So we've seen him since then and done that because in his mind, it's a stepwise process. When nothing else makes a difference, I'll have my knee replaced. That's, if someone approaches it from that point of view, we have plenty mm -hmm. of options usually for a patient. Mm -hmm. If someone because is trying- Because they don't have an expectation. Because, because they're already bad. Mm -hmm. Right. That that's that's I mean, we talked about that with the cool leaf episode when people say, well, is it can I make it so bad that you couldn't do anything about it? If I have cool leaf and don't hurt enough, don't I need to know that it hurts? No. Right. Like if you break this, you're going to know. Right. My goal is to make you feel better so you can get more miles out of it. Right. If the if every time a tire is a little out of line or needs air, you had to put a new tire on. That's what a lot of surgeons approach a patient like, mm -hmm. right? Like if, if I'm a tire replacement place and the only thing I can do is replace your tire, then everyone that walks in needs a new tire, right? Sometimes it just needs air. Sometimes the tire needs a line. Sometimes you got to rotate them. Sometimes, sometimes you do need a new tire. Sometimes it wasn't even the tire, it was the front end out line, <laughs> right? Approaching a patient like that makes a lot more sense than every time someone has a little bit of wear, you need a new one. Is there a patient that needs a new one? Yeah, we still do total knees. I still, I think that's the surgery that made me become a doctor, right? That I watched it change someone's life. It was really important to me. And, and it, I was bought in like, oh my gosh, they just, they gave my aunt her life back. Like, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Do I feel like everyone gets that result after a total? Do I think that there are a lot of people that are kind of sold a knee mm -hmm. thinking it's going to be no big deal and it's a big deal? I think way more people have come into the clinic with that than come into the clinic thinking that the cells are, well, you know, is, I don't think a lot of people expect what we do to just magically cure stuff. Certainly not if they've been hurting long enough or if they've had enough problem or if they've already had a surgery. And a lot of people by the time they see us have already had something done that didn't help a lot or they had something on the other side and they're still struggling with it. And so they're just not ready to have that done on the side. That's, I think, the typical patient for us, more, like, more often than not, is they're seeking us out because they already know the downside of the other part. I mean, that literally, when we talk about mm -hmm. the, the name of the podcast, the zero downside, it's not because anything has a zero downside. Mm -hmm. But the downside of what we're talking about is so much less than the traditional approach on lumbar fusion, a total knee replacement, a total shoulder, a total hip. Um, a, a, a little thing like the big toe, like hallux rigidus, a bad degenerative joint of the great toe, extremely painful. Mm -hmm. Is there a really cool surgery for that? Yes. Did I help develop part of that procedure, the same kind of implant in the shoulder and do a lot of, yeah, I'm a big fan. Is it a big deal to get through that? Yes. Do we still do that for some people? Yeah, because mm -hmm. there are people that need that. Is there a lot of downside? to that procedure as far as length of recovery and the amount of time it takes to bear weight and being on crutches and walking. Yes, we get people through it and it's a big deal. They do great. Long-term, I don't think we have one of those patients we've done a hemiarthroplasty on a great toe that isn't really happy. But there are plenty of patients we've helped avoid that procedure with an intra-articular injection to break loose the scar with cellular allograft that heals the inflammatory load, breaks loose some of the scar and even though it looks bad on x-ray and they may not have all their motion, it doesn't hurt anymore. And so they get to go on with their life and, and, and push the hands of time back for years before maybe we have to do it again. Or maybe someday they do need a more invasive treatment. But to, my, to this point, there's a lot of those kind of problems that we've treated thinking that maybe I'm just buying you time. And now we're five, six, seven, eight years out, 15 years out and still haven't done, you know, I still have arrows in the quiver because I never had to really even pull out the bow, right? I didn't, I didn't cut on them. I, I took some cells from them, concentrated their marrow down, stuck it where the body would like to have had it and, and couldn't get it, and they got better, lowered their inflammatory load. And I think that the hallux rigidus in the great toe is mm -hmm. probably one of those things that when you compare it to what the more invasive options are, the recovery time is, is dramatic. And the recovery time of being asleep, having that broken loose and injecting it is, is really low.
Mm -hmm. I feel like if patients ask themselves, honestly, should I try this injection that Dr. McKinn is talking about, or should I just move on to traditional surgery with, without even considering the injection? I think most people would be willing to try the injection to avoid all of the downtime. Especially if they really understand, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people that have watched someone else go through it or people that had something done on the other side or someone who already had the procedure done and didn't get a lot better. Those, those are the patients that most seek us out because they've done their homework and they already know what pain's like. And, and, they've, and they've watched, I, I mean, my mom would never have had a total knee because she watched my dad die after one that he had done in Oklahoma. It took two years, but he had a stroke and a heart attack and then follow-up strokes. And it was all after a total. And I, you know, I was done his first knee down here 20 years ago. He was a lot different shape. 15 years later, he needs his other knee replaced. Had him, they live out of state, had him do it up there where his cardiologist was at the heart hospital, really high level of care, and he still did poorly. My mom, because of that, it didn't matter if she's bone on bone. She was never going to have a knee replacement. And so we had to find a more conservative options that still got her better. I mean, when my mom passed, her knees weren't bothering her. And it wasn't because she had a total knee. It was because we found some conservative treatment options with cells and ablation that made her a lot better. And she wasn't having pain that kept her from doing anything anymore. And, and that's usually the downside of what we're talking about is usually so mitigated. The only thing that makes this even complicated at all is the way insurance works, right? Because if someone's coming cash pay out of their pocket for surgery, when people fly in from Turkey, or you know, when, they, they, when someone flies in from out of the country, they always are flying in for the least invasive thing we have because it's way more affordable mm -hmm. than a $50,000 hospital bill, mm -hmm. right? I mean, even a cash pay knee scope for a lot of people is 10 grand. The cells and ablation, less than, way less than that, right? So if someone's comparing it fairly, right? If it's not part of a big, if someone's coming out of cash for a shoulder reconstruction, $60,000 surgery, or for a couple of thousand bucks, I take your bone marrow, take this amnion, inject it, move your shoulder around while you're asleep. Like if you're paying out of pocket for that, you having the biggest, most invasive thing done every time? No. The only thing that makes this controversial at all is because insurance doesn't cover the conservative part of what we do a lot. They'll make you go to, now they'll, they'll cover a lot of therapy beforehand. They'll cover some steroids that can make you worse. But if you take the insurance mode out of it, if, if someone's just like, if I'm paying for this out of my pocket, what is the most, what's the option I'm going? Sell your medicine wins every time mm -hmm. because there's nothing a hospital delivery mode can do as efficiently as we can do in the clinic. For sure. I mean, a bone marrow kit in the hospital is 8,500 bucks. Yeah. Right? I feel like patients get stuck on insurance. They're like, well, that's, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Well, honestly, if you go have traditional surgery, your insurance, yes, may cover 80% of it, 70% of it, but you're still getting stuck with the rest of that bill. Which, mm -hmm. in the scheme of things, you're you're talking about thousands of dollars versus tens of thousands of dollars. For sure. And you're, I mean, you're still paying for the anesthesia bill. What they don't cover of the anesthesia bill, you're paying the facility fee, the doctor portion. So therapy, I, I, I eight weeks out of work. Yes. Like, I mean, how how do you even make up for a two to three month recovery after yeah. a total or a fusion? Like, there's a, the average downtime after a lumbar fusion is three to six months out of work. 50% of everyone that has a three-level fusion is removed from the workforce in the first five years. Yeah. So compared to not working again, right? I mean, all of a sudden, the downside of what we're talking about is it's a no-brainer from a, if, if, all, if all sides are equal and we're comparing outcomes, not, you know, what insurance covers and doesn't. Now, health savings accounts have changed that. That's what that, I was going to say. Has mm -hmm. changed that a lot, right? Because HSA money is your money to spend on you. Yes, and care credit. Care credit. Mm -hmm. it, especially in the more self-insured world. Look, there's a lot of insurance companies out there now that are kind of self-insured insurance pools. They love cellular medicine and they'll reimburse patients for it. And patients come out of pocket with a lot less than they would have spent because they just saved their insurance company so much money. I mean, an insurance total need, you know, $100,000. And we did an ablation and put cells in both knees for you know, less than 10 with anesthesia and injecting four other body sites, 
do you think the insurance company is really happy with rather giving them that eight thousand dollars back or paying the hospital hundred thousand dollars come on that's not a question right and, and oh by the way then all the therapy and everything associated with the total and, and then the patients that get a clot they end up on a bunch of blood thinners. The patients that get infected, the patients that have a redo, the patients that have failure of the quad tendon, anterior knee pain syndrome after a total. All that's really common. So if insurance covers it, you're still coming out of pocket regardless. Regardless, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but because people are always like, well, insurance doesn't cover I, I get it, right? Like it would be a concern for me for sure. But I had two back surgeries within a month of each other, one at the end of the year, one in January. And I had $10,000 major medical deductible on my back. I had to come up with the copay on two surgical procedures within a month of each other. It's like buying a car cash. There's no way to plan for that. Mm -hmm. Destroyed me economically, especially at the holidays when you don't get paid a lot in medicine because the insurance company shut down. And oh, by the way, you're spending more money. And it was, it was economic disaster for me. We didn't have this option back then. If I would have had this option, with that free fragment and know what I know now, would I have injected that first and saw how I do? Absolutely. Because it would not, it would have cost me less to have this procedure done than the co-pays and deductibles I ended up paying. And oh, by the way, since I had a failure and an infection within the month later and had to do it all again, it wasn't, you're not choosing between one surgery or an injection. Sometimes you're choosing between two or three surgeries or an injection, right? So. I think that we worry really hard on setting expectations back because it, we know it's not a magic trick. Like even though we do this and we improve your situation, is it gonna make all of your symptoms go away? Maybe not. Did I make anything worse? No. Did I put you at risk? No. Would everything else I could have done been harder for you to get through? Yeah, that's the reason we chose this together. But I usually set up that flow chart with the goal of the patient gets to pick. Where are you at in the overall scheme of things? Like if you've tried all this, this, and this, it may be, you may be all the way down here, right? But I always put the bottom of the page, what's the last thing that I ever wanna to do to you? Joint replacement, shoulder replacement, total hip, a knee replacement, big revision surgery on some bad tendon injury that you had, uh, joint replacement on a big toe, mm. right? And we laugh about the big toe, but it's really hurts. Like mm -hmm. if you can't walk, it, it midfoot arthritis, there's another thing, what, we're comparing it to fusions. We make a little incision, put a patch in there and fill it with marrow. Those patients have done really well. And I wouldn't have, I, the first couple of ones that we did six, eight years ago, I gave them no hope of it making a difference, but patients wanted to try something first. They've been told by everyone else they needed a midfoot fusion. They still don't have a midfoot fusion. And now the first three or four patients we've done, now we've done their other side too because it was a genetic kind of predisposition with they, the flat foot part of what they had. Yeah, even patients with total knees are candidates mm. for us. For sure, because a so lot of them still have quadriceps tendonitis, infrapatellar tendon failure, chronic medial collateral ligament pain after a joint replacement. Mm. And all those are things that you can't just cut the scar out without it scarring back in, but you can inject that scar tissue and give it a chance of being a healing being less inflamed, kind of repopulate. The way I think of scar is this big stromal, dense tissue that has no nuclei in it. Well, if there's no nuclei, there's no cellular health. And so when we take marrow aspirate and we inject that dead tissue base, we're kind of repopulating the trellis with vines, right? Like I'm sprigging the yard with new grass, like all these different analogies of you have this dead area that hurts because the dead area hurts because there's healthy and dead tissue mismatch. And so everything you do causes it to stay inflamed. If I inject cells in it, we can kind of get that to heal. Scar gets worse over time. Healing never just invades a lot of that scar on its own. Mm -hmm. If we inject it, we can get that to happen mm -hmm. a lot. Well, I Pretty think gratifying. It, yeah, it sounds like it really is a candidacy determined by the patient's decision on the outcomes of both options, surgical and non-surgical. And I think you do very, very, very well explaining those options to the patients. You're not a doctor that's like, yes, I have something that's gonna fix you. Like you give, here are all the options, non-invasive and invasive. Here are gonna be the outcomes. And really it's up to you. Do you want to have the effects of post-care with surgical invasion, which you are gonna have to be off work. You're gonna like, do you have the time and finances to do that? 
or does it sound more realistic for your lifestyle and your current economics to, you know, try the shot? The if it helps you wounded. avoid. Yeah. Right? We talk about wounded. the walking wounded yeah. all the time. Rather the walking wounded than the laid up injured, mm -hmm. um, yeah. recently repaired and still not better. Mm -hmm. right? that I can keep people active. Mm -hmm. is the most important thing of keeping people out of major reconstructive surgery. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to keeping people active, our goal, and, and Ashley's heard me say this many times in the patient part, I don't ever want to burn bridges until it's time to burn the bridge, right? There, you know, when you're taking over an island, there used to be a little statement, you set the boats on fire mm -hmm. so that no, everyone knows you're committed, <laughs> right? In medicine, you don't want to set the boats on fire very often, right? Because you may not be committing to something that has a, a now, am I really happy with our knee replacements? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would I still be doing them if it didn't work? No, I think it's a great surgery. As long as the patient's ready for it. And as long as that nothing else helped. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a ton of people out there and we've proven that, that have been told they need a fusion or they need a total knee or they need a new shoulder that we still have insanely active years down the road and have not done anything surgical other than cellular medicine. Because they're not willing to accept those risks. They understand mm -hmm. what the risks are and they're just not ready for it. Or the and that's cost. okay. Yeah. Like if someone's coming out of pocket, I can come out of pocket and get these injections done or I can have a $50,000 surgery. I, I Probably not doing that. Unless I know for sure that $50,000 surgery was the only way I was going to be able to get through this. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you got to, you know, what's the old saying? You got to eat the frog, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people aren't ready to eat the frog, right? You just have to, it, what else could be done that's easier? So. And I love the way you put it, Ashley. I want to encourage all of our viewers and listeners, go check out some of our other episodes because we definitely do mention all of the risks, all of the side effects to traditional routes in which we're not trying to knock them. Like you said, Dr. Yeah. Gunn, you love total I'm needs. an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> yeah. I like surgery. But, like I'm, <laughs> uh, it's, it's where all my secondary gain comes yeah. from. Like You realize that when a surgeon gives up a substantial part of his life, mm -hmm. The good part, you give up your 20s and 30s. Like mm -hmm. that's when you're healthy and happy and like you, you, the, you see the world is full of potential. Mm -hmm. I was in school the whole time. I didn't see the world as full of potential. I saw it was a very limited scope of a library, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you give up that, like you have to think what you do is really important mm -hmm. to the world. I'm gonna make the world a better place with this new skill I have and not, and not everyone can do that. Mm -hmm. But it's not the it's not it's not a nothing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, even though I'm really impressed by by how much we can do surgical and all the new technology that we're able to incorporate in the care of someone, there's a lot of people that just don't need the most invasive thing we have, or just physically aren't able to get through it. Mm -hmm. So, like I was saying, go check out those videos so that you know you can make a more educated decision on your treatment plan because at the end of the day that is whose hands it's in don't let one opinion tell you you need surgery and you take that as that please you know go watch some of our episodes really hone in on if you hear your specific condition rewind it rewatch it try to understand it more so that you know all your options and of course we appreciate all of your time and all of our subscribers if you have any suggestions of future episodes or any questions please feel free to comment below and again, I'm going to end this episode with um, thank you for your trust, um, your, your trust and giving us the opportunity to take care of you is the reason we do this. So I wanted to say thank you. And thank you, Ashley, for joining us Thanks again for having me. today. Appreciate it.